Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Podcast Pasta. That's a podcast that's like pasta, not the podcast that's about pasta. As always, I'm your host, Mike, and today I am joined with Fat Brett. You are a video essayist. You focus on topics relating to video games. Um, you also have a number of different series. I think you have like, uh, it's you call it like the deconstruction of villainy, in which you, you know, it, it's applied in the title. Uh, Brett, how are you today? Uh, I'm fantastic. Thank you for having me. That's great. Now, Brett, I I always like to, I don't know how much of, obviously, this podcast that you've listened to before coming on here, but I know I gave you a very brief introduction, but I always like to have my guests kind of expand on that and I guess explain in your own words uh, what you do and what kind of motivates the content that you create. Um. Okay. I, uh, well, I, I definitely make write essays about video games and post them on YouTube. I can say that for sure. Um, I've I haven't been doing this for very long at all. I don't feel like I started posting videos just a little over a year ago, and it's already. Um, I feel like the kinds of videos I make has already changed really dramatically in that amount of time and i definitely also still feel like i'm experimenting and and testing what what kind of videos excite me to make and what kind of videos audiences get excited about but that's kind of a rambling answer that you don't want to hear you want something much more concise and interesting i uh the videos that seem to do best that are the most popular are um analyzing well, analyzing is a little pretentious. They are discussing uh, video game stories, video game narratives, and characters from video games. And I, as much as possible, talk about them from a writing perspective, um, keeping the discussion focused as much as possible on um, the writers who wrote these stories and the choices that they made, keeping, like... Just keeping in mind whenever you're discuss whenever I'm discussing a story that these were written by human beings and they were human beings making choices and every every single choice they make was for a reason and every single choice we can kind of look at and we can think, okay, why did they make this choice? What effect does this choice have on the audience? What are other choices they could have made and how would that have changed both the story and the emotional effect that it had on us. Does that answer that question at all? No, yeah, that's 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 a great answer. Um, so I, I guess uh, as because I've talked to a few other video essays and usually, um, you know, they come from a multitude of different backgrounds depending on you know um, whether they're analyzing film or video games. And I, I can gather, I don't want to make like any assumptions here, but I, I can gather that you obviously do have more of the writing background, um, you know, uh, in terms of, but I, I guess uh, I, I always like completing the story. So I guess um, before you got into content creation, what were you doing? Was this like, um, were you like studying in school or did you like just jump right into doing this type of video essay style content, like just right out the gate. Um, hmm. Well, what was I doing before this? I was, um, I, I was just a, a fat, drunk, unemployed loser living in his parents' attic. And I had, uh, like last year I had just finished writing a novel that, uh, it turned out that nobody wanted anything to do with, no publishers or literary agents wanted to touch, and I, you know, I had a moment where I needed to decide whether to either uh, get a job and stop being a loser, or uh, I could start a YouTube channel. And so I chose to start a YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah. And then I made, I made, uh, like, I spent six or seven months making weekly videos about Nintendo Wii games that got like no no views at all like five like five views of video and then i got really lucky last uh october or november when the last god of war came out and i made videos about that and they did unbelievably well 
Uh, and yeah, then, that's how I actually learned about um, your work, I think, was the mm -hmm. one analyzing um, Mimir and how he kind of um, represents this, uh, well, the way that I see it is kind of like this move away from, because, you know, the usual Hollywood trope is that, oh, if you have a hyper-intelligent character, right, that they tend to be very antisocial, right, because they have to, like, give him, like, a, a nerf, like, oh, being too smart is, like, too strong, we gotta nerf him somehow. Right, it's like the always, the always the way that I, I like think about it in my head, um, and so I, I found like kind of um, your perspective on Mimir, Mimir refreshing in the sense that it's like it was like kind of a move away from that, and that you know you can write these intelligent characters while still having them um, very uh, compassionate. But um, I, I guess focusing on a, a bit of your work here, like you said, you do um, analyze the writing in films and, you know, from this kind of standpoint that it's written by, like, people, right? At least for now, ho you know, hopefully it stays that way, you know, for the foreseeable mm -hmm. future. But it's all in the air with AI, obviously. But um, I, I guess at, at least right in the context of right now, like, what... What writing tropes do you see in a lot of video games that um, I, I guess you're not necessarily like a fan of, so to speak? Mm, tropes that I'm not a fan of. Um, well, I guess we could stay focused on God of War and uh, Kratos specifically as a character. I think he's at least in these Norse games, I find him to be one of the most interesting video game characters ever written because he is, he has so much darkness and within him he is so very flawed. Like I was just playing the first one again today, the first of the Norse games, I guess God of War 4. But in the early parts of that game, he is so... <sighs> Unlikable would be too hard of a term. But the way he interacts with his son, it's very uh, abrasive. It's lacking in patience and it's not very compassionate. And he's a hard character, a hard character to like in those moments. But then at the same time, you get the moments where he is, he's clearly so very hurt by the death of his wife. And he feels like you can see both in the animations and the acting and the writers, like how unready he personally feels to be a father and how unworthy, and you have these. Within him, he is such a complex character, both in his flaws and in his humanity and what makes him unlikable and what makes him deeply sympathetic. And I, that is a trope, that would be the opposite of a trope I don't like, which is to compare to, say, another big Sony franchise, which is the Horizon series. And they also had a release last year. And there are a lot of things about the Horizon, how the story in Horizon Zero Dawn and Forbidden West that I really liked. But one thing is that Aloy as a character is extremely likable. She's very personable and she's very like good-hearted and genuine and honest and and yet she's so boring because she's just has no flaws like she's just not or she doesn't they kind of tried in forbidden west to kind of like oh she she works too much on her own but it's like well she saved the whole world on her own so i just don't know if that even really counts as a flaw but so many main characters in video games are just are not interesting <laughs> they really they really struggle like uh or like there's this new the new jedi game i can't remember what the new pretty boy jedi's name is anymore but gosh what a what a dull character compared to the supporting cast like there's a i didn't actually play the newest one but in the previous one the supporting cast there's like an older jedi who is sort of mentoring him and she has so much darkness and she has had such terrible fl failures in his life and then there was the foil villain young uh sith uh, huntress who was kind of chasing him down and she had so much humanity within her and then 
But at the center of this story full of kind of complicated and flawed and human characters is this like this gosh, what would you call him? Like white bread uh, toast. mayo milk toast sort of character. That would be that would be the next uh I don't next to anything. I don't know where I was going with that. That's something that I think video game stories need to overcome. That's something video game stories need to do better, is main characters. It's kind of strange how good video games are at supporting casts. They're very good at, often are quite good at creating flawed and mm, sympathetic and human supporting characters, but so often the main characters are, are much less so. Do you think that has to do with, like, the fact that, you know, since, I don't know how to, how to explain this, but, like, since you don't play as a supporting cast, it's, like, given that much more, like, freedom, so to speak, or, because I, I think you kind of do have an interesting point in the sense that maybe, and this is just me speculating, but that um, a lot of writers, they figure, oh, well, since you're playing as the main character, we don't need to, like, write that connection that the player has to feel with the main character because you're embodying their actions anyways. I guess if that makes sense. Um, do, you, do you think that might be like a, a reason or, or I guess how would you explain that kind of issue that you have with a lot of these uh, video game main characters? That's interesting. I mean, your suggestion is interesting that the connection between the connection between the player and the character they're playing as is already so surprisingly deep, even when it's a character who's like not a character, like how much some people love Gordon Freeman, who is a character you don't even see, like you just see his, his hand floating in front of you. And I don't know about it anymore, but there was a time when people just absolutely loved Gordon Freeman from the Half-Life games. And you're like, there's nothing here <laughs> like compared to like even like people love link from zelda or samus from metroid and they are equally just blank total blank slates and people do completely love them as well though i guess they do at least both have interesting visual designs that you can connect with and link has expressions at least i guess samus has some cool poses but Players definitely do become deeply attached to a main character, sort of almost without any work on the part of the writers. So that's an interesting point that you brought up. Like that happens even to the point of like a character like Joel from The Last of Us. Oh, I remember I, when I played The Last of Us I, the first time, I found him to be deeply like a deeply troubling character, like an extremely human and well-written, but like a morally, ethically, deeply troubling character. And then I went online and I found all these people who just absolutely adored Joel. They loved him so very much and I was so shocked by it, but I think it's the same thing where char players identify with the characters they're playing as on a, on a, surprisingly deep emotional level regardless of who that character is or how complex they are so that's probably that must be part of it and i'm sure the writers of video games are aware of that too though i wouldn't think that they look at that and they say oh well we don't have to do any work on the main character in this jedi game because the players will like them no matter what i Gosh, I, it must, I would guess that it has to do with some kind of corporate, corporate culture in writing of we need to make this character, you can, uh, we need to make this character very appealing to a mass audience because we want to sell this to millions of people. And so like a, a character like maybe Kratos or Joel, who are much, much more complex and much more human are going to you would think appeal to less people than just kind of a generically nice guy like the Star Wars Jedi character. I should look up his name instead of just keep calling him Star Wars Jedi character. I know character. who you're talking oh, about, too. I, I also can't remember the name, but he has uh -huh. like red hair, right? 
Yes, red hair. I like the actor too. I just, I'm blanking on the character's name also. So yeah. fine performance by that actor as well. It's just I, I think more appealing if you are just a generically good character without serious flaws. I would guess is probably the thought process. But then obviously Kratos and Joel are evidence of the opposite that you can have a deeply flawed and human character and i think people latch on to those far more i feel like i see people still talking about joel and kratos far more than i see them talking about aloy or <laughs> that poor nameless jedi from the star wars game um yeah i, I was thinking in context of um the, like the example I was thinking of was like Agent Forty Seven because like don't get me wrong mm. I love like the Hitman games but like to me like you know Agent Forty Seven's characterization with exception of like maybe Absolution to some degree but it's always been kind of minimal in the sense because uh, I I'm just in my mind I I always see him as like literally a tool like not like he's dorky but no he's like a tool he's like a weapon so by design he's like never supposed to have like a personality and yet you're drawn to him because like you know he like kind of conveys like how you interact with the world he's like an extension of you um but... and he has he has the barcode on the back of the of his head that's the really kind of distinctive design choice with him i mean obviously he's meant to look very nondescript he's meant to look like very average like average tough bald white guy but then he has that barcode sticks out so much because it like i think that does a lot for his at least his visual design i agree with you i mean he's meant intentionally meant to be very blank but like that barcode kind of he goes from just being a totally average white dude in a suit to being how oh, he's this man is a product like he is owned like he's very literally owned is interesting sorry continue you were about to say something else oh no i was just gonna um i i guess i'm kind of curious about uh your your process in creating um a video in term because like to, to give you some background for myself I've, I've told my audience a few times but um for a little while i've considered like actually doing like video essay stuff myself when i first started the podcast it was more like a rant style where I didn't like really sh I, I just had like a general topic that I want to talk about and then I would like rant about it for like 30 minutes or an hour or so um and for me I never got to the video essay th stuff though because I hate proofreading my own writing I, I just can't stand it like I, I hate how I sound when writing I guess um but I, I guess for you, are there any like aspects of doing this like video essay work that you just just loathe yourself? Uh, that I just loathe. Uh, definitely editing the audio. I hate... I don't know if I hate listening to my own voice anymore. I definitely... I used to do... I used to teach online classes. That was the first time I really had to spend a lot of time listening to my own voice as I created these... Le I wrote lectures and then I recorded them and put them up for my students to listen to and when I first started that I remember hating like when I was editing the audio and I was just listening to my own voice for like an hour and just like slamming my face against my desktop and being like god I hate I hate myself so much I hate everything about my voice which now that was a couple of years ago now I've I've spent so many 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 hours listening to my own voice I guess I don't I don't have that anymore, but it's just such a tedious and, and boring and uncreative process, the editing of audio. It's just, it's just like, uh, it's just flicks of the wrist. It's just repeated doing the same thing over and over and over again. That's the only part that I don't enjoy. I mean, obviously the writing is awesome. I love writing and um, even reading it, I don't mind as much as I once did. I kind of enjoy i don't know if i wish i could take like some kind of like uh like voice acting class sometime so i could actually know if i'm doing any good if i'm doing well at all while 
reading these, but I kind of enjoy that too. And obviously editing the video is, can be a lot of fun, but editing the audio is just, it's just tedious and mundane. I complain to people around me about it all the time. I'm sure they're, everyone around me is sick of, of hearing me complain about it. But that would be it. So I guess because, like I said, you've had like um, a few others, like you, you've said yourself that you had a few series that you kind of experimented with, such as I think, um, if I remember your uh, videography, um, it was like you, you I, I don't know if you're still doing it, but like a series where you want to like review every Wii game and then like more recently you have your deconstruction of villainy. Um, so I, I guess... Uh, just like I guess, kind of walk me through how you decide, like, oh, I'm gonna try approaching this as like a series of videos, and like, I, I guess, just even broadly, how do you come up with like the topics that you discuss in your work? Okay, um, so uh, like any kind of writing analysis, literary analysis, whether it's video games or books or films or whatever i mean it all starts in the exact same way um like if like i have when i used to teach classes like this is how i would explain is that like if you want to write well when you're talking about other works like if you're analyzing a book or something well for my classes obviously it was books and essays but is you always start with um you just start with like that the most basic question of all is like what did you remember what stuck out to you what felt to you like it was important and if it's like a really good story like if it's a for example god of war if it's a really well written story there will be things in that story that just stick with you they just stay in your mind like you can't stop thinking about you or as as you're going through the story, they strike you so very hard. Maybe they're the moments that like make you cry or the ones that make you deeply, deeply angry or something to that effect. And that is, that's what you write about. That's what you, if you're writing an essay, you write about that. So when the story is really good, which hopefully it is, um, the topics should be really organic and obvious. Like you should kind of know as soon as you read the book or as soon as you uh as soon as you play the game like as soon as you're done you should know already these are the parts that i was i was about to say these are the parts i thought were amazing but that's a bit much these are just the parts that are stuck in my head these are the parts i keep thinking about over and over again and that's for for any game that well, now that I'm doing video essays about games, that's what it is. I mean, I'm just playing games that I'm interested in. And then if there are things in them that are interesting or exciting to me, and I think, and sometimes you hit on, you get really lucky and the thing that excites you is the thing that excites everyone else. And then people watch the video or click on it at least. Yeah, that's where, like, these villain videos, I think... I don't know what it is about villains that we're also... We're also very interested in. Like, I... I guess obviously I haven't tried, but I strongly suspect that if I did a series on, like, video game heroes, and I just did, like, a, a long video essay about each hero in the game, I bet it would not do... I bet not as many people would click on that or watch that as they do these villain videos we are we really are very interested in in evil i think but i don't i don't know if i know why that is um before we continue we have a, a word from today's sponsor uh brett have you had any issues with your uh laundry detergent by any chance no all the time ah every day well, had, do i have the product for you uh, today's uh, episode is sponsored by Salty Llama. Are you tired of lugging around heavy bottles of detergent and dealing with the mess of measuring the right amount? Introducing Salty Llama, the ultra-concentrated, hypoallergenic, and toxins-free laundry detergent strips that are revolutionizing the industry. 
Their eco-friendly strips are easy to use. Just toss one in with your laundry and you're good to go. With Salty Llama, you could say goodbye to harsh chemicals and hello to a cleaner, greener laundry experience. But it's not just good for the environment, it's good for you and your family. Their hypoallergenic formula is gentle and sensitive skin, making it perfect for babies, kids, and adults with allergies. Don't just take my word for it. Give Salty Llama a try and see the difference for yourself. You'll be amazed at how powerful and effective the detergent strips are. Visit www.saltylama.com and order yours today. And don't forget to use the code PODCASTPASTA at checkout for a special discount. Again, that's www.saltylama.com. Use the code PODCASTPASTA at checkout for a special discount. Um, so, I guess, I, I, I don't, I don't want to annoy you too much with this question because I'm sure, like, maybe you get a lot outside of, you know, um your work or, you know, in your personal life or whatever. But obviously the big trend right now with uh, video games is obviously video game adaptations that we've seen, you know, the success of like the Mario movie, the last of Us series, I would even go as far back as like arcane or cyberpunk edge runners. Um, so I, I guess with like this newfound interest in, you know, video game adaptations uh, from your perspective, is that something that you would ever be interested in, or I, I apologize if you have covered it, but is that something that you want to like delve deeper in your work or is that just something that it doesn't interest you in the same way? Um, I would want to do that. To be honest, I just, I watch so very little television or movies, not because I'm like too cool to do it, but, that there's just a limited amount of time in the day and I I want to play video games and read books and there are more of those than I could ever have time so like when the I wanted to do like I really wanted to do a deep dive into when the uh the Last of Us TV series was coming out and like um because it felt just how it that they told the story in the TV show felt so very different to me like I mean, that's such a perfect adaptations are such a wonderful time to discuss specifically writers choices, because instead of just speculating, huh, I wonder if they'd done this differently, what effect that would have on the story and the audience with adaptations, you get to see like an actual live example of like, oh, what if they like did something totally different with Joel's character and his backstory, like, and how is the audience going to respond to that differently? And how is that affecting the story? And so that should be something really exciting for me and something that I I wish I had, I had done or had time to do, but it's just, I mean, it's just time. It's just only so many, only so many minutes in the day, unfortunately. Right, right, I get you. Um, but I, I guess kind of focusing on that topic because you do have the background in writing and I mean, I get it. I don't want to be like an asshole, like, you know, asking like a cook, hey, can you also farm? But I, I guess in your mind, if you had to be like, let's say, approached with doing like a video game adaptation, like what would be some general like guidelines that at least you would follow for yourself in trying to like adapt a work? Hmm. Well... I'll tell you, I would be, uh, hmm, that's a good question. I would probably just tell them I don't know, but that wouldn't be fun for this interview. I'd probably just tell them, go find someone who <laughs> who gets paid to do that for a whole living or something. But that, again, that's not a fun, that's not a fun answer for an interview. Um, gosh, I mean, well, there's so many bad examples. Like there are so many like terrible, like, like there are certainly many examples of like what, what not to do in a video game at adaptation to the screen but what to do i mean people definitely people definitely hit on this last of us series in a huge way and i mean part of that is that last of us was so they could have just taken all of the cutscenes from the last of us video game redone them shot for shot and i suspect it would have done extremely well on tv because it was just a, an incredibly well-written, well-choreographed, well-acted video game. But they didn't do that. They changed so very much, and I've, all their changes I found to be really fascinating. 
And I think there are changes that if I had been in charge, I wouldn't have done. So I, I'm probably not the right person, wouldn't be the right person to be in charge because obviously they made those changes and it, it did fantastically well, both critically and with audiences. Uh, well, if you don't mind hey, asking, no, it, it, like, can you give us like a particular example of like a change they made that like you necessarily wouldn't have? I think so. I I only watched the first couple episodes, but the first change I saw that felt, uh, it felt like a huge. I mean, it like on the surface, it felt like only a small thing, but like I think it spoke to ch deeper changes in the character is um early on in the game there's this moment where uh uh ellie joel and his uh female partner who's only there for like the first chapter of the game whose name i tess was her name yes, yeah. they are like uh they're trying to get out of that uh i think it's boston they're trying to get out of that city and they are they get caught there's a like a guy with a gun to their heads and in the game joel sees his chance and he you know he bludgeons the guy to death or shoots him or something very violent but probably necessary in the moment and they get away but in the in the show they change it where you get this like you move into this internal this sort of like you see in Joel's head for this moment and he's like um it's like a post traumatic stress disorder situation where he's having these flashbacks to these terrible traumatic violent moments in his past and that triggers him and then and then he attacks after that and that's a very those feel to me like two fundamentally different characters like one of those is a character who is using violence as a tool in a very practical oh gosh i don't want to say business like because it's that's not accurate but in a very uh like violence is ordinary to this character violence is day is a daily thing for this character whereas the other is this is violence from a place of trauma or psychological wounds this is that's very like motivationally those feel completely different to me and i think i can see like if you are going like a video game can have an audience of like millions and then a, a tv show audience can have an audience of tens of millions so you need maybe they were worried that joel as just violence is ordinary to me and and i don't care about it would not be sympathetic to the audience in the way that he is to players when you are playing as him i would assume that's why that change was made but it it definitely changed the story to me and I, not for better or for worse but it was a very it felt very very different to me yeah admittedly i'm very surprised kind of at the success well i am and i'm not surprised at the success of uh the last of us series because on one hand obviously the last of us is a very popular game but on the other hand it it, it does like it, it approaches adaptations in a way that i think usually doesn't work which is like directly adapting a story um i've talked about this before but i've always been a fan of like more vibes based where it's like oh just focus on capturing like the feel of a world rather than directly adapting a story and because I, I think that's like what works in Arcane because, you know, League of Legends, like they say they have like a larger lore to it, but, you know, it's not really like reflected in like the game itself, right? Or um, even like Cyberpunk, which went with like a different story, but obviously it was motivated by like, you know, the game world itself. So, yeah, I was I was very surprised that, you know, a direct, a more direct adaptation like that could actually like... um work in that regard hmm. that's an interesting idea of uh, just stay focused on just stay focused on the mood instead of direct adaptation the one i was thinking of i don't know if you've seen the silent hill films uh, i have a friend who's a big fan of the silent hill games and films and we've been going through them at least the first recently one, yeah. and they uh those films don't try 
at all to really match the stories of those games at all. And those films are, are quite bad. <laughs> I think my friend likes them a lot, but I think they're quite bad. But I, all, I do, I feel like the stories in the games I find to be far more interesting than like in the movie, they adapt them almost just like a standard action adventure sort of way. Whereas in the games, they're, I mean, I guess some of them are so much more psychological and so much more personal. I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just rambling. No, that's fine. That's, it's, it's the show, pretty much. But no, for me, um, the one that kind of, an adaptation that kind of frustrates me because um, was like, the, and this is going to sound stupid because I don't think I've really talked about this on the podcast, was the Need for Speed one, right? Because to me, that seems like the easiest one to like nail out of the park, right? Like Need for Speed has such like, it does a story kind of question mark, maybe depends on the, like the game. But even then it's like, uh, it's cars racing, have fun. Right. And so it was like, oh, just copy like the Fast and Furious movies, but like maybe with its own twist. Um, but it, it just didn't work. Maybe they were like too earnest with the idea. I don't know if it's, it's such a that was like the one that I was thinking, OK, this is going to be the one to prove that like <laughs> it's such a stupid idea in my head. But like, oh, man, video game adaptations can like work in the sense that they could be like, you know, like. I mean, granted, the Need for Speed movie is never going to be like, you know, the Shakespearean work that we like analyze years later, but that can be like at least financially successful. And obviously it wasn't. Was there a Need for Speed movie? There was with Aaron Paul. <laughs> I don't remember that at all. Yeah, with Aaron when Paul. Was and this? I was so I was so excited. I like saw the trailer. I was like, oh, man, I, I, I can feel it like this is this is going to be the one. And then. Just let me down. I mean, this the later Need for Speed games, they definitely went they went hard for story. They went hard for like a like a criminal underground type story. I can't remember any of them, but I remember there being cutscenes that I thought as a kid I thought looked super duper cool. Well, right, but like, like you know, cool it's dudes. like a loose enough story to where like, you know, you mm -hmm. don't have to like make the feel like you could do your own story and just like again capture like the feel of like needs for speed, which basically be like fast and furious, but uh, I don't know. I I'm sorry. I I'm, I'm it's just uh I felt very passionately about like that movie working because I felt like it like could have, you know. I see that Need for Speed does seem like it should be easy. It seems like like car chase, newer underground film car chase movie. Like those exist. Like Drive. Drive is an amazing movie. That could be Need for Speed. Yeah, exactly. Almost. Um, and then you know you have the Gran Turismo movie, which just looks awful. It's like so such a weird adaptation. I mean, but it's like you know biographicals based on true story but like whatever i don't want i don't want to get into that <laughs> there's a gran turismo that, but... movie <laughs> I, don't, I don't i didn't realize all these racing games were getting adaptations well it's mainly those two and like to be fair like the need for speed one i think was like godly 2018 or something it, it's been a while back um is this gran turismo is this an upcoming movie it is it is an upcoming movie it's fascinating very interesting because i don't think do those games have stories okay uh do, do you want me to explain it to you or <laughs> go for it I'll, okay i'm interested so it's not adapting like an in-game universe basically it's adapting the story of like this kid and he's like a huge gran turismo like fan like he he plays on like the playstation 4 playstation 5 or whatever and um it's based on a true story of like this guy is like oh i'm gonna take the best gran turismo players and train them to be like real car racers right and it just follows that whole it's like basically a sports film but with gran turismo okay and, and it's, it's a true just, story did it work did they did these video game players become great i i didn't i didn't like follow through with like, sports car racers i feel like those skill sets are very different 
Well, yeah, and the film tries to like address that, right? At least what, from what I could gather with the trailer because it hasn't like come out yet. But like, you know, there's scenes where they like have to exercise because you know, obviously, there's a lot of physical conditioning with like mm -hmm. racing a car, right? But um, I, I don't know. I haven't like followed like the real life story because um, I, I saw the like the film adaptation. Like, nah, I'm out. I'm sorry. I'm a, not for me. <laughs> you know, I'm out. It, it sounds very silly. It sounds very very silly. Yeah, but I mean, in any case, um, so I, I guess if you don't mind, because um, at least in the context of like, you know, the video essay, and granted, I know like you're a smaller like creator, so I don't know how like connected you are necessarily with like the larger like YouTube video essay community, but I, I guess if you had to like, like, do you have any like dream collaborations? Like, let's say you get like bigger in the scope of your channel, like any like people that you would want to work with in the future? Hmm. Um. Once there was a, kind of this is going to be a roundabout and strange answer, and um, but it'll make sense. I uh, I once had a a professor in undergrad. I didn't like very much it was like this young adult literature class and I thought it was going to be I don't know why I thought that was ever going to be interesting because young adult books are so terrible for I thought they were going to be like good young adult books they weren't but I don't think she understood that and we didn't get along uh, she accused me of like of uh oh gosh what was it like weird things weird things with the people in my we like in the class we had groups of people we worked with and i was very good friends with everyone in my group and i at some point she became convinced that i was like i was like uh what would the word be i was like uh assassinating their their self-esteems or something like i was I was purposely trying to bring, tear them down or something. It was very strange. I'd been friends with them for years and we were very good friends, but, and I, can I talk to her about it? And finally she was like, well, you know what? You just, someday you're going to have to learn how to work with other people or you're never going to, you're never going to make it in the world. Like you're never going to be successful professionally if you don't learn how to work together with people. And uh, I feel like with this YouTube thing where I, I sit for hours and hours alone in this room in front of this computer, I have proved her wrong that I have actually been extremely successful not working with any other people. And so it's uh, I know it's kind of a shitty answer to be like, I don't want to work with anybody, but I don't want to work with anybody. <laughs> I want to, unless I have like a million subscribers and I'm like doing amazing, I want to continue. Like, I swear this professor doesn't even remember who I am and I'm, I hold this weird, uh, psychologically unhealthy grudge, but I, every like time I get another thousand subscribers, I'm like, aha, I, I'm still doing it. I'm still doing it alone. And I feel like a collaborator would, they would spoil that for me. They would spoil my, uh, my vindication. Well, that's a fair answer. Well, I mean, thank you for at the very least collaborating with me on this show. Mm. Um, oh, does this count? I mean, no, let's just say no. So we can continue, <laughs> <laughs> but does it count? Then you just book it out. Mm. Um, but I, I guess in your own leisure time, like, uh, you know, do you only play video games in the hopes of, like, analyzing them? Or do you have any, like, games that, like, you just play as, like, kind of, I don't know, just, like, a way to, like, zone out? Like, I play Street Fighter, which, I mean, don't get me wrong, like, I have to think intensively, but obviously it's not in the same way that I have to, like, think through a narrative. It's just, like... Oh, is he gonna do a cross up? Uh, oh, I gotta react to this with a command grab, you know, things like that. But so do you have anything like that for yourself? Yeah, that's definitely what that's definitely what platformers are to me, especially now that Nintendo has all of like they have so many of their classic SNES and SNES, and even Mario sixty four platformers on the Switch now is that platformers are so perfect because you can just shut your brain off and you can just kind of jump around and you can just get into like a flow state 
Like, there's just zero thought involved in a platformer at all. It's just a, like, they're almost like rhythm games where you just get into the rhythm of, like, jumping at the right times. That's, that's that for me. I was just playing before this interview, uh, Mario 64 again. I've become determined that I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get all the stars in that game. As a child, I could, I could only dream of such a thing, but now I'm in my 30s and I, I insist. I insist that I'm, I'm old enough to get all the stars in Mario 64. Oh, I wish you the best of luck on that endeavor. Um, mm. But I, I guess, uh, 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 how do I want to word this? Um, so... Well, I, I guess I'll, I'll start with this. Um, so, you know, do you, I, I don't know how far out you plan like your episodes and what you're, you're, you know, you're working on, but I guess, you know, for the sake of the podcast, I have to ask like, what, um, do you have any more immediate projects on the horizon or is it just kind of in the air right now for you? Um, well, my schedule right now is two, two videos each week. Um, I just put out a, uh, I just put out another Zelda of Tears of the Kingdom video today. And then on either Friday, I don't know if I could possibly get it out by Friday, but definitely by Saturday, I have a, a video about the new Amnesia game that came out. Is it this month? It was this month. And then later this month, uh. I wanted to do some videos about this new System Shock remastered, and I wanted to do more videos about uh, about Zelda as well. And I've been looking, I saw they released a demo for the new Final Fantasy, and I'm very curious. It would be really nice if that turned out to have like a really worthwhile story. Final Fantasy is very hit or miss. It'd be really nice if that could have a really worthwhile story, because uh, if not, my uh, my schedule is going to be very open very soon. If I that mean, answers I've heard good that question, about it myself. I have as well, though. I just don't. Sometimes, uh, video game fans on the internet they lead me astray, so I just never know when I can trust them. Hmm, that's fair, but two videos a week—that's like. That seems like very extensive for like, you know, especially like a video essay where, you know, it can, it can obviously range depending on like people's schedule and stuff. But like, um, so how, how do you maintain like that? Con like, I mean, I grant, I don't know how consistent you are with it, but how do you maintain that like type of schedule for yourself? I have been pretty consistent mostly. Um, I believe it's been mentioned that I'm, I'm fat drunk unemployed and living with my parents so that that leaves you with a dramatic amount of time i suspect that most people who had the amount of free time that i have could probably put that many videos out a week um i mean the most time consuming part is the writing and i write um i write at minimum at least three thousand words a day and most essays, most essays are not longer than, I don't know what the average would be, somewhere between three and, say, 6,000 words. So they can be written in a day or two days very often if I'm working, if I'm working efficiently. And then the, my editing process is so incredibly simplistic. Sometimes I can't believe that anybody puts up with it when they watch these videos how like when i watch video essays they are always like so visually interesting like they're all doing such smart visual things but i'm a writer and not an a video editor and so i don't know how to do any of those things so all i can do is uh rely on hoping that my writing is very engaging rather than my visuals but when you're doing extremely simple video visual editing you can you can work very quickly hmm. no that makes sense i mean your your videos are very impressive i, I would say um in terms of their like uh quality of, obviously even beyond i think the writing I, I think your videos like obviously work very well um 
But I, I so I guess uh so I guess, you know, obviously uh people branch out like, you know, um you know, you have video essays that like eventually when they get bigger, like they move on to some people obviously do like a podcast. You know, they they branch out to like other projects like that. Is that something that you would ever do or would you always just want to focus on doing this like video essay style work? Well, my uh my three hobbies, my three main ways that I spend my time are that I I play video games and I read books and I listen to podcasts and so I have uh, I've started making videos about video games and I've been unsuccessfully writing books for quite a while now no publications but writing them so I I think that I have uh, I am incapable of not turning my hobbies into uh into work i guess would be a way to say it so eventually i simply must my my psyche will require me to uh try my hand at podcasting i actually did once upon a time a friend and i we started a uh it was a time splitters themed podcast i don't know if you've ever played the any of the three time splitters video I games time splitters. Keep going. okay <laughs> we, uh, that does still exist, I think. I suspect if you if you Google the name Time Splitters Fun Podcast, it might pop up. It was years ago. It was terrible. We were very bad at it. We got very, very drunk and uh, we sat in my bedroom and we talked about tried to talk about time splitters and somehow failed. I mean, you you wouldn't think that it should be possible to fail at at such a thing, but who dead air nothing interesting to say it was a it was a very poor effort but i've tried before so maybe i'll try again oh well that, that would certainly be um very uh it should, i mean obviously i'm a, like a fan of like other people doing like podcasts because it's always like interesting to see different approaches to it at least from my side of things um but uh, at the time of this recording, uh, because, you know, obviously I don't know when people are going to listen to this episode, uh, we're coming off uh, Summer Games Fest, you know, a whole bunch of announcements, a whole bunch of, like, footage released. I, I don't know if you necessarily keep up with that yourself, but um, I, I guess I'm curious, even, like, in a passive sense, is there anything that, you know, has been announced or talked about um, that you're interested in your hoping to get into in in the future um there was there was definitely there were far too many games being announced in the last i don't know i guess week it felt like there was like a hundred different game announcements in the last week which on the one hand is kind of awesome because i thought e3 was dead i thought that i thought we weren't going to do this in june anymore but it turns out that all of these companies are still going to announce all of their games this week, which is awesome because it was always E3 was always so much fun. It always uh, it always felt like it always felt like Christmas, but at like the opposite end of the year. So I had like two things to look forward to during the year. But this isn't answering your question. Um, uh, there was, gosh, I thought almost everything that was announced i thought looked completely awesome <laughs> like i was i was extremely surprised by how much how many good things there were the one that i feel i don't even know if was this summer games fest where they announced the uh the remake of metal gear solid 3 no, or was that beforehand that was... i think that was a playstation showcase i might be wrong right that's right because they're doing every company's doing its own individual showcase now but that is metal gear solid 3 was um it was a game that i was completely obsessed with like gosh 15 years ago i guess but i never for some reason i never ever played it i like endlessly watched videos about it and read about its characters and particularly my memory like i had metal gear solid 2 on the playstation but for some reason even though i was so very obsessed with metal gear solid 3 
and reading about it and watching videos. I just never, my little baby boy brain just never like was like, oh, I should go buy this. <laughs> I can just, this is something that I could have at home for some reason. But so I never played it. I was so obsessed, especially it had like a group of villains that I remembered. And again, I've never even actually played it, but they each of them they were like assassins or something and they each had like very distinct and different styles and they each seemed so very very cool like i particularly i remember there was one guy who was just really really old and maybe he was like a sniper <laughs> he was um, just an old guy end. was I he think... even just called old man maybe no no he was called like the end i think if oh I the end that's name. right yeah, i because think they you're have, like, right call signs like that I, I might be mistaking him for That's the right. guy that you fight, like, in the river. But mm. it, it's it's something like that. Like, I think the end or something like that. I don't know. that. I definitely, I distinctly remember that old guy seemed so incredibly interesting, especially because I believe there was, I don't know if Easter egg is the right word or secret, but if you, like, turned the PlayStation 2 console off for, like a month maybe or something before fighting his boss he would uh he would have just died of old age and i remember thinking that was so incredibly brilliant <laughs> it's so smart but that was i am incredibly excited to have a chance to actually play it gosh i could play that on an emulator right now i don't know what is wrong with me that i just don't play that game but i'm extremely excited i'm extremely excited to have a chance to play Metal Gear Solid 3 for real, and hopefully it's really, really good. I don't know if we can actually... I don't know if we trust Konami anymore, but... Hopefully that is completely amazing. Right. Uh, yeah, I just... I looked it up right now. He, his name was The End. Um, the End. That sounds right. I, I guess while I, mm. I have you here, um... Because uh, a while, like way back when I first started, uh, back when I was doing solo content, I did kind of a retrospective on like Kojima games, talking about like my own experience, like playing these games. And um, so I, I guess I'm kind of curious, like, are you yourself a fan of um, of Kojima? I mean, I imagine you you probably might be, but I mean, humor me. Um. I definitely loved Metal Gear Solid 2 when I played it, though I was much, though I was about to say I was much too young to understand anything that was happening, but I, I actually suspect that even if I played it now, I wouldn't understand the story at all. Because my memory is that it was very confusing and convoluted. And 3 seemed so incredibly interesting to me. And I remember trying to play 4 on uh, maybe it was my brother's playstation 3 or a friend's and i got to the like that famously that game has like a two hour long cutscene, like 30 minutes into the game maybe maybe not even 30 minutes in maybe it's like 15 minutes in and i i hit a pretty hard brick wall on that and then uh the fifth one i remember watching my roommate play i don't know why i'm just listing them off i don't know about kojima <laughs> it's like like i remember pt was so incredibly amazing and i remember being so very excited about death stranding like the cutscenes looked so amazing and then i played it and i was and then i was like wow like these first three cutscenes are amazing and then every other cutscene is just like a character talking at me for a really long time so yeah. I don't know. I guess I, my my answer might be no. I can't tell. He's certainly distinctive in a way that few other video game creators are. Like his games are so they f are so very much Kojima in a way that you know who can tell who made I don't know this most recent Star Wars game. Like how can you tell? that that was made by someone different than whoever made Horizon last year. Like, a lot of these games feel so very similar, but Kojima certainly feels distinct and different from every other game developer. 
Well, right. I, yeah, I, admittedly, I've also been very conflicted on like Kojima because, in many ways, I, I do recognize him as like this talent. I, like I said in my retrospective, I think he like he's a very strong like scenario writer in the sense that like I I do very much remember like as a player playing his games, like you know what I went through or like what the characters went through, but in the context of like especially me playing them. Now, granted, I don't know if that's, like, a bias because, like, I was controlling the characters in those moments as opposed to, like, them being, like, strictly cutscenes. But, um, but like, the, the main issue that I, I had with Kojima is that the, the way I would describe it is that he's always kind of afraid to, like, leave something to, like, interpretation, like, over fear of, like, mm-hmm. oh, what if they misinterpret it? And, um, uh, look. A spoiler alert for those of you who haven't played Death Stranding, but the example that I gave was uh, at the end where you had the big reveal that Mad Mickelson's character is like basically Sam Porter's like dad, right? And I, I thought, I don't know, I thought that like to me, because I don't know if you like beat the game yourself. I'm sorry if I spoiled it for you, by the way. Oh my God, I didn't even yes. think to ask. I did. I I did. Okay. <laughs> I know. But, um... I don't know, it, like that. That always bugged me because I always thought like it, it like something like that could have worked if you had just like left it open to to interpretation. Um, but yeah, so I I guess like do you is that an issue you see with like Kojima's writing or is it like or do you have something some other like beef with him? Uh, not to say that you hate Kojima, but obviously, certainly, I think you're definitely right about Death Stranding. Um, over explained to uh to a a strenuous degree much i think yeah there was a lot in that game that could have been left open to interpretation he had created such a beautiful and compelling world and then he just explained it and explained it and explained it through cutscenes forever like it just so much more information than you could possibly need. I like compare it to like the From Software games, which do such a wonderful job, or almost like uh, too much of a job of never explaining enough and yet being so compelling almost for that reason. I do think Death Stranding had such interesting ideas that if it had instead of spending so much time explaining them to the character if it had allowed or to the player allowing the player to find those organically through the setting could have been hmm, much more compelling yeah so no yeah i mean it's it's tough to say i hope um because he said he was also going to get into um like eventually i think directing his own film because you know he has his own studios so like why not um but obviously he's going to be busy with death stranding too so i i guess i'm i guess i'm interested to see where he goes with that um i, I always wonder well because i know that he he does work with other writers but i, I would imagine most of it is just him um so I hope maybe in the future he could just like kind of pull back the reins and like have somebody else focus on like more of like the world building and he just does I don't know the character like the you know the larger lore of it or something like that. Um, but uh, we are approaching the hour mark. I could obviously pick pick apart your brain all day, but um, I guess just for the sake of your own time, uh. Thank you so much for coming on uh, to anyone listening or anybody even watching. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. If you want to support the podcast, you can do so in a um, number of different ways. I have a Patreon account for uh, monthly donations. But if uh, you want to support me like for one-time uh, payments, I also have a Ko-Fi account. Uh, Patreon, I, the Ko-Fi also lets you do the monthly payments, but I, I recommend Patreon more because you have like the different tiers. Uh, on all the tiers, you get your name read aloud in the credit section, but since I don't have any patrons, the section's left blank right now. Um, but if you, uh, I also have a merch store, so if you want to support me and also get something, 
while you're doing it, I would definitely recommend that. There's a lot of great designs by um, an artist I frequently collaborate with, uh, George Isaac from Nocturnal Essen. Uh, all of this is linked on my Twitter account. I have a link tree at the in the bio section. Uh, the account is at Podcasting Pasta. Again, that's at Podcasting Pasta, all one word. Uh, it's all lowercase. I don't know for Twitter if that really matters. Uh, Brett, thank you so much for uh, joining us. If you want to shout out where people can find you and your work. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, just Fat Brett on YouTube. Okay. And um, so, yeah, uh, thank you once again to Salty Llama for sponsoring the episode. And uh, take care, everyone. Bye.